surely it is relevant. After all, what are the facts? Mr. Papalonis's oil tanker, the Black Gold, was in collision after leaving the estuary with another British ship, the Prince Charming. And the Prince Charming sank with the loss of four lives. Many were injured. Yes, yes. And now the relatives are demanding compensation. And not only the relatives. There's the owners of the ship's cargo of oil, the three local authorities whose beaches have been polluted, the owners of the Prince Charming, the salvage company, and... and the British government. The British government? It's a punishable offence to discharge oil in prohibited sea areas. You see, it will take a lifetime to sort out. I disagree. But we have so many legal battles to fight. It comes to only one legal battle, Mr. Papalonius. Allow me to explain. Please, but slowly, yes? Remember, I'm a humble Greek ship owner. My English is not too good, you understand? I do indeed. Now, you own the oil tanker, the Black Gold. And as the owner, you are normally responsible for the safety of your ship and her crew. Yes. In this particular instance, you leased your ship to a charterer. Yes. You and the charterer drew up a contract. Such a contract is called a charter party and includes a number of clauses. Yes. For example, we have the charterer stipulating that the captain would take his orders from him. And then there's this other unusual clause, giving you the right to appoint the chief engineer and the radio officer. Yes, there are also other clauses. Yeah, they in... needn't concern us at the moment. Now, according to you, this contract was a charter by demise. The word demise in this instance meaning transfer, which means that the charterer became the temporary owner of the black gold, and as such, he was responsible for the safety of the ship and her crew. Yes. But he maintains that the contract was a simple charter. In other words, he merely hired the black gold from you. You, therefore, remained her owner, and as such can be held liable for any damages resulting from her collision with the Prince Charming. I understand. Good. Now, if we can prove that at the time of the collision you were not the owner of the black gold and held no form of control over her, it follows you cannot be held liable for any damages. Now, that's what I meant when I said we had only one legal battle to fight. If we win, that is. So you see the ownership and control of the black gold as the central issue? I do. But will the other interested parties? I'll be able to answer that when I've spoken to Mr. Wrighton. He's representing the charterer. Unfortunately, he's in court at the moment. She can't talk to anyone. I'm sorry I'm not allowed to disturb her. Those were my orders. Good afternoon. Who is that, Rosie? Oh, someone from Miss Peterson. Who? They didn't say. Did you ask? No. But you got their phone number. No. It could have been important. But you said no one was to disturb her while she was swatting up on her mercantile law. I meant you weren't to disturb her. You didn't say, Mr Coletti. I should have thought that that was obvious, Rosie. Well, I'm sure if it's important, they'll ring back. <coughs> See? Hello? Oh, yeah, uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, yes, so I believe I do apologise if a little misunderstanding. You know what temper is like. Uh, just a moment. Mr Wrighton would like to speak to you, Miss Peterson. You're through. But I'm not a temporary, Mr Coletti. No? I think we ought to have a conference of all the QCs involved. Great minds, Harriet. Of course I agree. As I see it, one specific action will clear the decks considerably and limit any other litigation. And that action must be between you representing the ship owner and me representing the charter. It won't be enough just to know which of them was in control of the black gold. After all, there was negligence aboard. Oh, yes. Negligence on the part of the chief engineer. Not at all. Negligence on the part of either the captain or the pilot. Would that be because they were my client's servants at the time? Whereas, of course, the chief engineer was undoubtedly the servant of Mr. Papalonius. Nonsense. He couldn't have been. Oh, I can see we are going to enjoy ourselves with this one. Well, the point is, will the other silks be prepared to await the outcome? We woo them together, shall we? In that case, we'll have the conference here. We make a better pot of tea. I bow to your superior Darjeeling, Harriet. Can I leave you to make the necessary arrangements? Excellent. Goodbye. Well, she's agreed to the battle order. All we have to do now is to neutralize this clutter of silks. And that won't be difficult. Because of her beauty and your low cunning. Or is it the other way round? Are you looking forward to acting as my junior? Very much. Strange that a woman should want to specialise in shipping law. Miss Peterson never specialised, did she? Don't let that fool you. I shan't. I just hope I get the opportunity to prove myself. You will. 
But first, she and I have to get rid of these hangers-on. And as you are aware, gentlemen, the collision in home waters between the Black Gold and the Prince Charming has resulted in a vast amount of litigation. And marketplace haggling, so undignified. And unnecessary. In other words, you'd like the rest of us to retire gracefully into the wings uh, so that you and Monty can hog the centre of the stage. As I see it, everything will fall into place the moment we know who was responsible for the management of the Black Gold at the time of the collision. The ship owner or the charterer? Whoever loses will be liable for all claims resulting from the collision, provided, of course, the black gold was the negligent party. Yeah, but the claims will amount to millions. Our respective clients would prefer not to spend the next 20 years being dragged through the courts. They want a sudden death. Ah, but supposing you're the corpse, Monty, what will you do? Stay dead, of course. Oh, you won't. I know you. You'll spring back to your feet and appeal. In that case, we'll get any appeal pushed through as quickly as possible. Provided you allow us a clear run until after the judgment. You're not going to take us by surprise and plead act of God, are you? Yes, that'll put pay to all future litigation. And leave us with egg all over mm. our faces. I assure you, gentlemen, I shall not be pleading act of God. Monty? I must say, such a Machiavellian tactic does rather appeal to my sense of humour. But no, let it be said here and now that the Almighty was unfortunately busy elsewhere at the moment of collision. Well, personally, I think that the action should be between Harriet and me. Why you? Because I'm representing the owners of the Prince Charlie. We don't know yet that my client was in control of the black gold. It might turn out that my client was. So what do the rest of us gain by waiting for the outcome? You'll know which of us to proceed against. Yes. I must say that makes sense to me. Hmm. I suppose it would simplify things. Then may the best man win, Harriet. He won't in this case, Monty. That's right, Harriet. Don't let him browbeat you. And for goodness sake, don't let him steal the limelight. Well, there's nothing she can do about that. I have my own portable spotlight. Then I just hope that you get Seton as judge. <laughs> and I have an excellent understudy in Faye Joyce. A woman? Yes. You're going to have competition, Harriet. Why? Is she that good? Good night, Mr. Colletti. Night, Rosie. I'm not really a temporary, am I? Mm. I mean, I've been here over a year now. How can I be a temporary? Or were you joking? Joking? When you said I was a temporary. Did I? Yes. I don't remember. Well, you did. Well, what about it? Well, it's been worrying me. You? Worry? Of course I worry. What have you got to worry about? About being a temporary. But you're not a temporary. Well, you said I was. You... Oh, I must have been joking. Then I don't have to worry. We're very pleased with you, Rosie. Then my work's satisfactory, is it? You make a lovely pot of tea. Good night. Good night. Uh, Rosie, that was a joke. Why don't I make a lovely pot of tea? Good night, Rosie. <sighs> uh, I'm off now, Miss Peterson. Oh, good night, Bill. I've left you a line. Thank you. Looks, uh, looks as if you're going to be here all night. I've come to the conclusion that if you want to understand the psychology of seamen, all you have to do is study mercantile law. I think I'll stick to Captain Hornblower. <laughs> Haven't uh, seen Dr. Moody around lately? No. Not, uh, not ill, is he? I don't think so. Yeah, well, uh, I'll be off then. Uh, good night, Miss Smith. Who is that? You know perfectly well who it is. Oh. Hello, Harriet. Did you ring me just now? No? Why? Why? It's just the phone was ringing when I came in. It stopped as soon as I got to it. I, I just thought it might have been you. No, 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 it wasn't me. 
I uh, hope I didn't disturb you. No, 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 you didn't disturb me. There's no need to apologize. I wasn't apologizing. Oh. Uh, um, how are you? Very well. You? I've got a headache. Take an aspirin. I did. It didn't do any good. Well, if you can't cure yourself, who can? Are you worrying about anything? No. No? Are you? No, no. Busy? Very. Mountain of work to get through. Uh, then I'll let you get on with it. Very obliging of you. Thank you. Goodbye. Um, did you say something? No, no, just goodbye, that's all. Goodbye. Before you call your first witness, Miss Peterson, I should like to clarify two points. You said your client, the ship owner, reserved the right to appoint the chief engineer and the radio officer. Uh, he exercised that right, yes? Yes, my lord. Remind me, please, why he had this clause inserted. It was Mr. Papalonius's duty to ensure the hull, the machinery, and the radio equipment, and to make certain they were kept in an efficient state. Thank you. You said there was a pilot aboard the Black Gold. Yes, my lord. He was, in fact, on the bridge at the time of the collision? Yes. Fascinating. Right, you may start your marathon task, Miss Peterson. And as the owner of the Black Gold, you entered into a contract with the charter company. Yes, it was a charter by demise. It was not a simple charter. No, it was a charter by demise, which means I granted control and possession of the ship to the charter. So in your judgment, the black gold was leased to the charterer? Yes, because I had agreed not to interfere in any way with the management of my ship. Yet you did have a clause inserted giving you the right to appoint the chief engineer and the radio officer. Much damage can be done by inexperienced officers. I wanted to safeguard my valuable property. It may be said that by having that clause inserted, you retain some control over your ship. The man in control was the captain, no one else. Thank you. A charter by demise means that the charter is, for all practical purposes, the temporary owner of the ship, whereas a simple charter means that the charterer has but hired the ship and has no interest in the management of the ship. Why this lecture on the obvious, Mr. Wright? It would appear, my lord, that Mr. Papalonius does not know the difference between a charter by demise and a simple charter. I do charter. know the difference. My client will state that the charter party, the contract, was a simple charter and that therefore the management of the ship remained your responsibility. No, because the captain was under the orders and direction of the charterer. But you had control over the chief engineer. No, he took his orders from the captain, who in turn took his orders from the charterer. It was agreed that you, as ship owner, would appoint the chief engineer. Yes. Did you pay his wages? Yes. And it was his task and duty to keep in an efficient state the hull and machinery? Yes. Would you consider the steering mechanism part of the machinery? Yes. If it's proved that the steering mechanism was responsible for the collision, would you consider it possible that the chief engineer had been negligent in his duties? It is possible. And as you had appointed him, you would naturally hold yourself responsible for him. No, I do not accept that. But it was your choice, and therefore your servant. No, not my servant. You did pay his wages, did you not? Yes. Thank you. Why didn't you stay to talk to me? Didn't seem any point. Wasn't that why you were there? Well? Bill said you telephoned to find out which court I was in. Did he? Ian, I've swallowed my pride by coming here. The least you can do is try and swallow yours, even if you do choke to death. I've missed you. Have you? Yes. I'm bored having no one to argue with. Well, aren't you going to say anything? Such as? I've done my confession bit. Now it's your turn. Well, of course I've missed you. I know very well I have. I'd like to hear it. You've just heard it. Is that all I'm going to hear? All right. I could quite cheerfully have strangled you when you trampled all over me in that court case. I told you there was nothing personal in it. I was only doing my job. Life's been hell without you. And with me? That's hell, too. So what's the answer? Stop loving, I suppose. How? Exactly. Unless... What? Nothing. What were you going to say? Well, unless we... Got married? No. Well, now you've brought it up, well, it's, uh, it's worth considering. 
Then consider it. I don't like to be pushed. I'll push you, all right, out of that bloody window. Isn't it nice to be on speaking terms again? We won't be for long if you don't say yes to your own proposal. Oh, come on, Harriet. Let's get it over with and have a bit of peace. That's all I want. I don't want anger and temperament and excitement and depression. I just want a little bit of calm. Slippers by the fire? Yes. Newspaper put in your hand? Yes. Buttons sewn on your shirt? Yes. Do you know how long it is since I've had breakfast in bed? You do live in a fantasy world, don't you? Well, what do you say? I've gone off the whole idea. <laughs> In which capacity did you sign the Bill of Lading? In my capacity as the Charterer's agent. You knew you were the Charterer's agent? Oh, yes, I was told that I'd be under the direct orders of the Charter Company. Where were you when the collision occurred? I was on the bridge, alongside the pilot. He was navigating. Is it normal procedure for a pilot to navigate the estuary? Oh, yes, yes, because of uh, natural hazards and beyond, you see. It's compulsory. Does that mean the pilot was not a servant of the Charter Company? No, no, no. He was indeed a servant, Miss Peterson. The defence of compulsory pilotage was abolished in the Pilotage Act of 1913. That act provided that the owner or master of any vessel navigating under circumstances in which pilotage is compulsory shall be held answerable for any loss or damage caused by the vessel or by any fault of the navigation of the vessel. But then I'm sure you knew that. Momentary mental aberration, my lord, but I thank you for reminding me. It's helped me to recall Workington Harbour Board and Towerfield. Yes. That action was heard by the Lords in 1951. Or was it 1950, my lord? Was it? Yes, you're right. Well, I'm glad I've been able to remove your mental aberration, Miss Peterson. And I yours, my lord. Please continue. Who was in command of the ship at the time? I was. Now, the pilot simply acts as an advisor. The Nord, 1916. You were therefore in control of the ship? Now, well, it really amounts to a sort of divided control. The pilot is there to advise, but the captain can disregard that advice. It depends on the circumstances. But there is no doubt in your mind that both you and the pilot were servants of the charterer from the moment the black gold sailed. Now, I have no doubt of that at all. Please tell the court, in your own words, the sequence of events leading up to the collision. Well, the two ships were approaching each other on converging courses, my ship and the Prince Charming. Now, the Prince Charming had us on the starboard bow, now that means it was their duty to keep clear and it was our duty to keep our course and speed. However, the Prince Charming didn't keep clear, didn't change course. And when the two ships were relatively close to each other, the pilot suddenly asked for a sound signal to be given to indicate that we were going to change course. He then ordered my ship to starboard. Now, he did this without asking my advice as to the relatively slow steering capability of the black gold. Now, what it meant was that nothing happened immediately. Well, now, the Prince Charming must have decided that either we weren't going to change course or that we couldn't do it in the time because she ported as we starboard. We struck her in the starboard quarter with our stern. You said the pilot did not ask your advice as to the steering capability of your ship. No, you did not. Has the black gold always been initially slow, changing course? That's a yes. It's one of her eccentricities. And as far as you're concerned, there was nothing wrong with the ship's steering mechanism? No, nothing at all. Thank you, Captain McGregor. Thank you, madam. <clears throat> May yeah, I say, it's not often that an action of this nature allows us the privilege of hearing from two such charming lady members of the bar. Yes? On this particular voyage, Mr. Papalonius's company hired out your services to my client. I take exception to the words hired out. As it hasn't as yet been established whether or not the contract was a simple charter as my client maintains, Surely I'm entitled to use the words in question. It has been established that because of the terms of the contract, Captain McGregor was without doubt the charterer's agent. Yes. Who is your employer now? Mr. Papalonios. You are still employed by him? Yes, yes, I have been for uh, almost 20 years now. Why have you remained in his employment for 20 years? Well, he's, he's a very good employer. He's been very good to you? I feel a certain loyalty towards him, yes. I suggest, Captain McGregor, your loyalty has blinded you to the truth. I don't think so. 
But you would agree it's in your own interest as a servant of Mr. Papalonius to tell the truth, but not necessarily the whole truth. As far truth. as I know, I've been completely truthful. You were told you'd be under the orders and direction of my client. Yes, and that was true. What else were you told? I was told there would be a clause exempting me from liability for any accident of navigation. So, if it's proved that there was any accident of navigation, Mr. Papalonius, your employer for 20 years, would not be liable. That's right, the charter would. It would therefore be to your employers and your mutual advantage if it could be agreed that it was an accident of navigation that caused the collision. Yes. Did you know that the chief engineer was appointed and paid by Mr. Papalonius? Oh, yes. Something else you forgot to mention? No, it's just I wasn't asked. Did you know the chief engineer? Well, we've sailed together on and off for about 12 years. Are you good friends? Yes. Yeah. Loyal friends? Yes. Is he, like you, still employed by Mr. Papalonius? That's right, yes. On the day of the collision, was he responsible for the ship's steering mechanism? There was nothing wrong with the steering mechanism. Are you a qualified engineer? No. You said the pilot suddenly asked for a sound signal to be given. So you were fully aware he was about to order a change of course? Yes. Why didn't you tell him then of the rather slow steering capability of the black gold? There wasn't time. But surely if there was time to send a sound signal, there was time not to send it. In the same breath he asked for the signal to be given, he ordered my ship to starboard. You could have countermanded that order. Yeah, but it's a bit difficult having two captains on the bridge at the same time. Pardon me, there was only one captain, you. The control was divided. There was only one master, you. Why didn't you countermand the order? The maneuver would have been quite safe if the Prince Chairman hadn't ignored our sound signal. In other words, you'd have given a similar order. Uh, I don't know. But you agreed with the pilot's decision to change course. You don't seem to have any understanding of what it's like. You're on the bridge, eh? You've got two ships bearing down on each other. There's no time to agree or to disagree. You've got to do something and something quickly. You've got to act without thinking. Are you now saying you didn't think about your ship's rather slow turning capability? Oh, yes, I did think about it. Then why didn't you countermand the order? I wake up in the night asking that same question. What answer do you give? There's no answer. I don't know. I suggest you gave no thought to the turning capability of your ship. Oh, I did. You fully expected her to start her manoeuvre much earlier. No. That is the reason you didn't countermand the pilot's order. No, 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 that's not true. I suggest mm. that your ship did not normally have a rather slow turning yeah, capability. But she did. I suggest she did not respond sooner because of a fault in the steering mechanism. Uh, no. No, no. I'll not have that said. Do you wish to re-examine Captain McGregor? No, my lord. In that case, I shall adjourn until 10.30 tomorrow morning. Congratulations on your cross-examination. Thank you. Are you specialising in mercantile law? I'd like to, but as you know, it's very much a male preserve. And will that stop you? No, it's an added incentive. I'm glad to hear it. I think someone's trying to attract your attention. My husband. Is he one of us? No, he's a doctor. Excuse me. Oh. I hope they allow her to specialise and don't dig in their manly heels. Why all this interest in a woman barrister? Well, it's just she reminds me of myself at that age. How many years ago was that? You're as romantic as a haggis. She's even married to a doctor. So could you be. I know. And I've been giving it a great deal of thought. What, since you went off the idea? Yes. I think it could work, Ian. Of course it could work. I've always said it could work. No, I'm agreeing with you. Agreeing? With me? I missed having you around. I didn't like it. Are you, are you telling me you actually want to get married? Yes. I need a drink. What finally changed your mind? A man and a woman laughing together. What? When you first asked me to marry you, I was still struggling. I was still a junior. Now I'm a QC, I'm head of chambers. I proved to myself I could do it. And I honestly believe I can now combine marriage and a career without either of them having to suffer. Is that enough for you? Not quite. And because I love you. That's better.
And? I love you, too. <laughs> that's better. <laughs> well, I'm glad that's settled. So am I. I hate indecision. Yes, it means I can move in here now. I much prefer this plant to mine. Oh, I don't know. I think yours has a lot to offer. No, no. Uh, we'll live here. And a uh, quiet wedding, I think. Yes, definitely a quiet wedding. You start laying down the law, it'll be so quiet you won't even be invited. Where shall we have the honeymoon? Rome. Not Paris? No, Rome. What's wrong with Paris? Nothing wrong with Paris. It's just that I prefer to go to Rome. You'll like Paris. Of course, I like Paris. As we fly over it en route to Rome. But the independent survey did say there could have been a fault in the steering gear. There was no fault. How can you be so positive? A full inspection of all the machinery was made prior to sailing. Everything was checked and double-checked. My lord, the case of McFadden and Blue Star Line may be of some assistance to the court. Allow me the privilege of quoting it, Miss Peterson. As chief engineer, you are satisfied the vessel had that degree of fitness which an ordinary, careful and prudent owner would require his vessel to have at the commencement of her voyage, having regard to all the probable circumstances of it. Yes, the steering mechanism was not responsible for the collision. And yet there was undoubtedly an unusually long time lapse before the Black Gold started her manoeuvre. No, not unusual, not where the Black Gold was concerned. She's always been slow to turn? Initially, yes. And then she turns like an angel. And but doesn't that prove she must have had a fault in her steering gear? Well, I've stripped her down. I've had correspondence with the shipbuilders. I've had other engineers look her over and they all agree. There's nothing wrong with her. It's just that she has a rather slow heartbeat, that's all. Thank you. May I remind you we're discussing a ship, not a human being. She's a human being to me. I see. And are you infatuated with her? Yes, because she's a good ship. She has no faults. None at all. You are infatuated with her. You said everyone is agreed that there was nothing wrong with the ship's steering mechanism. But that's not entirely true, is it? Yes, it is. No, because the survey suggested the steering mechanism momentarily jammed. It didn't jam. But it could have done. I'm telling you, it didn't jam, and I should know. Please don't try to bully me, Mr. Lawrence. You said that prior to sailing, the mechanism was checked. Yes. You agree mistakes in checking can occur. I'm not paid to make mistakes. Are you implying you've never made a mistake? I've never made a mistake that has endangered the safety of the people aboard my ship, never. You personally checked all the machinery? I gave it the final inspection, yes. You didn't do the checking? No. You left it to others? Yes. How do you know they did their job properly? They did. Why? Did you stand over them while they checked every single part of the machinery? I knew she was working properly. How did you know? By the feel of her, by the sound of her. The fact is, Mr. Lawrence, you didn't personally check every single part of the steering mechanism. There was no need. Would Mr. Papalonius have expected you to check it? He had complete faith in me and in my judgment. Otherwise, he wouldn't have insisted on me being chief engineer on that particular voyage. He gave you the impression that you were answerable to him. Well, of course I was answerable to him. And not to the charterer. Well, what did they know about the black gold? Nothing. How could they? As you say, how could they? When did you first realize your ship had a rather slow turning capability? Let me see, she made her maiden voyage in September, or oh, about a year ago. Then she wasn't always slow to turn. Not for the first three months, no. She developed the fault about a year ago. It wasn't a fault. What would you call it then? A normal change in performance due to a general loosening up. You didn't consider it a fault, and yet you stripped her down, wrote to the shipbuilders and asked other engineers to inspect it. I thought it would interest them, that's all. But the sudden change in performance must have surprised you. It wasn't sudden. You mean it gradually worsened? I mean it gradually changed. And you were surprised by the change? Yes, I was. You didn't consider it normal? I was curious. It wasn't a normal change, yes or no? I hadn't come across it before. Did you send a report to Mr. Papalonius? Yes. He therefore knew that there was something wrong with the ship's steering mechanism. There was nothing wrong with the steering mechanism, and that's the gospel truth! And anyone who says differently doesn't know my ship! Did Mr. Papalonius tell you that on this particular voyage you would remain a servant of his company? He said I'd have to answer to him if anything went wrong with machinery. He said that to you? Only because he knew with me there nothing would go wrong. Thank you. How's the vat going? Well, I hope to finish it tomorrow. Branton sent an RFE yet? Apparently the check's in the post. Good. Oh, well, I remember it, Bill. Please keep Friday the 13th free, will you? Oh, you've got some uh, engagement on, have you? I'm getting married. Oh, I see. Well, I'll make a note of that. You're getting married? Yes. Uh, to Dr. Moody. Oh! 
Oh, uh, uh, congratulations. Yes, thank you, Bill. On uh, Friday the 13th? Well, you're not superstitious, surely. Well... Oh, nonsense. It'll all go like a dream. Well, knowing what you and Dr Moody are like, I wouldn't bank on it. The wedding's at 2.30. We don't want any fuss. And we want as few people as possible to know about it. That being the case, would you mind very much being the best man and one of the witnesses? Well, it'll be a pleasure. Good. I'm, uh, I'm choosing my wedding outfit in the morning at nine, so I'll go straight on to court. <laughs> this news has made my day, Miss Peterson. Bill? Hmm? Not a word to anyone. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, where are you going for your honeymoon? Dr. Moody wanted Paris, I wanted Rome, so we've compromised. We're flying to Venice for the weekend. Venice? What's wrong with Venice? It's sinking. <laughs> I've been managing director of this charter company for nine years, and I know what I'm talking about. It was not a charter by demise. Uh, Mr. Beltham, <clears throat> there was the clause in the contract regarding provisions and wages. Yes. There was the clause regarding any accident of navigation. Yes. There were the bill of lading provisions. Yes. But you still maintain that the charter party was not a charter by demise. Yes, and I shall tell you why. Mr. Papalonius inserted a clause which stipulated that the hull, the machinery, and the radio equipment would be the responsibility of the chief engineer and the radio officer, respectively. Furthermore, he insisted that he would appoint these officers and that he would also pay their wages. I, therefore, did not have full control of the ship. In other words, because of that clause, Mr. Papalonius did not give up the management of the vessel to me. Thank you, Mr. Feltham. You would agree, Mr. Feltham, that both the captain and the pilot were agents of your charter company? Yes, but even if it's proved a navigational error caused the collision, I'm satisfied the black gold was not responsible. No, no, no. Whether either or both ships were wholly or partly to blame for the collision is not our present concern. The two questions before us are, who controlled the management of the black gold at the time of the collision, and was the negligence aboard the black gold before the collision? Well, the simple answer to that is Mr. Papalonius had control of the black gold and the negligent party was the chief engineer. Were it that simple, Mr. Felton? Yes, Miss Peterson. You agree the captain and the pilot were your agents? Yes. Therefore, it was not a simple charter? It was, because I didn't have full control of the vessel by virtue of the fact that the chief engineer and the radio officer were answerable to Mr. Papalonius and not to me. They remained the servants of the owner. Not if it was a charter by demise. It was not a charter by demise. It was, because the captain was under your direct orders. But not the chief engineer. He took his orders from the captain. No, from Mr. Papalonius. Mr. Papalonius had nothing to do with the running of the ship. He didn't even know for which port the black gold was bound. If I hire a car, madam, I don't have to tell the owner my destination. Under the terms of the charter party, you had full control and possession of the ship. No. Are you saying there were three captains aboard? Are you saying the chief engineer and the radio officer were laws unto themselves? I'm saying the chief engineer was answerable to Mr. Papalonius for the hull and the machinery. It was his duty to keep them in an efficient state. Mr. Papalonius insisted that this clause be inserted. Therefore, Mr. Papalonius is responsible if it's proved there was a fault in the steering mechanism. We simply have to come to a decision about whether we're going to stay on the Lido or in Venice itself. You decide. Oh, no, no. Whatever I decide will be wrong. My brain's reeling with charters by demise, charter parties, simple charters, what they Very well, then. We'll stay on the Lido. That means crossing the lagoon. Well, what's wrong with that? It's lovely in the moonlight. I get seasick very easily. Oh, God. Who said I was as romantic as a hag is? Oh, forget Venice. We'll go to Paris. But you originally wanted to go to Rome. No, we'll go to Paris. I don't mind going to Rome. Well, Paris is nearer. I've never been to Rome. It was you who originally suggested Paris. What about Amsterdam? Oh, God. Well, what's the point of taking that attitude? It's not my fault if you keep on changing your mind. Well, you're the one who suddenly brought in Amsterdam. Only because we can't agree. I've agreed to go to Paris. But you really want to go to Rome. Right, so we'll go to Rome. Except that Paris is nearer. For pudding, did you order that custard pie? No. Pity. <laughs> Ian, I'm thrilled with my wedding outfit. It's beautiful. How much? It's got heavenly full sleeves caught at the wrist. How much? And a flared skirt. How and much? it's going to look fabulous underneath my mink stole. How much? No, I don't want to know. 
Before you asked for the sound signal to be given, as pilot of the ship, did you notice anything unusual about the Black Gold's maneuverability? No, her steering appeared to be normal. What would have happened if the Black Gold had started to change course at the normal rate of turn for such a ship? There wouldn't have been a collision. Were you surprised that she took so long to begin her maneuver? I was horrified. I remember thinking, my God, her steering's jammed. No, I'm sorry. Uh, she's not available on the 13th. No, the 13th is out. You're looking at the wrong day, Mr. Collins. The next available day uh, is the Monday. No, better make that the Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Will do. Bye. But she is free, Mr. Collins. She is not free, Rosie. She's got a very important engagement on. Unlike you to forget to put it down. I did not forget. I just did not want little teenage eyes seeing it. That is all. But say you're ill that day. Who'll remind her? Well, she needs reminding me just as well if she forgets it. Hello? You said her steering appeared to be normal. Yes. As you were navigating the estuary, did you have to change course at all? The changes were minimal. Uh, therefore, you would not have known whether or not the black gold had a rather slow turning capability. Well, her steering seemed to be all right when we swung into the estuary after loading. Ah, but that maneuver would have been carried out at a very slow rate of speed, yes? Yeah, I see what you mean. Any fault she had wouldn't have shown up then, probably not. No. The two ships were approaching each other on converging courses, and the Prince Charming had the black gold on her starboard bow. That meant that under Rule 19 of the Collision Regulations Order, the Prince Charming should have kept out of your way. Yes. But she didn't. And so you decided to change course. Yes. You didn't consider asking the captain's advice before giving that order? It was an emergency situation. You gave the order in the agony of the moment. Oh, yes, my lord. Would it be true to say that if you had not given that order and had continued on course, the collision would not have happened? There wouldn't have been a collision if the steering mechanism aboard the Black Gold hadn't been faulty. Both the captain and the chief engineer have maintained it was not faulty. Oh, believe me, it was a lifetime before she started turning. Yes, but that was because of her rather slow turning capability. Then why didn't the captain countermand my order? Like you, Mr. Turnton, he was reacting to the agony of the moment. No, he must have thought it was the correct order under the circumstances. But was it the correct order? Yes. Tell me, Mr. Turnton, when you gave that order, were the two ships still converging upon each other? Yes. But surely that means they hadn't passed into the final phase, where action had to be taken. Therefore, you were wrong to change course. Well, with respect, my lord, under Rule 19, the Prince Charming should have kept clear of the Black Gold. Under Rule 19, my lord, the Black Gold should have kept her course and speed. I submit that the Black Gold could not have been expected to obey the rules once it was seen that the Prince Charming had no intention of obeying Rule 19. What's happening? Is she trying to say I was to blame for the collision? Did you consider the Prince Charming had allowed time for the Black Gold going by? Well, quite honestly, my lord, I just don't remember what was going through my mind at that time. Just so I don't know what's happening now. Do you wish to comment, Miss Peterson? If Mr. Turnton had obeyed the rules, the question of whether or not the steering mechanism was faulty would never have arisen. Mm. Are you trying to say I'm responsible for no, the dead and the injured? One moment, please. Mr. Wrighton? The same can be said if the Prince Charming had obeyed the rules, but she didn't. Yes. Well, this is a most interesting point and certainly raises a number of questions. Do continue with your cross-examination, Miss Peterson. Uh, yes, Miss Peterson. What have you been up to, Rosie? Yes, Miss Peterson. Problems. Why is that? Seaton's reserve judgment on the shipping case. And when is he giving it? Friday, Friday the, the 13th. 13th. And don't say I told you so. What time's the judgment? Owing to some official function, he's had to put it back until 3 o'clock. Mm, you can still make it. Half an hour to get married and get back to court. Can be done. Need a police escort to get us through the traffic. Well, the only alternative is to postpone the wedding. Dr. Moody's already booked the hotel and he's not one to lose his money. He's also booked the return flight to Amster uh, Copenhagen. Copenhagen? I thought you were going to Venice. No, Copenhagen. Well, personally, I still think you can do it. Oh, it'll be such a rush. Needn't be, won't be. It'll all go like a dream. I'm here, thank God. Harriet! Bill's arrived. How long are you going to be? It's your fault I'm late. You shouldn't be here, should you? No, and I'm having to suffer for it. Now, here's the ring. Uh, just a minute. Your carnation. We're never going to make it. Harriet! Coming! Did you tell the taxi to wait? Yeah, well, uh, after the ceremony, he's going to take you to the court and then on What if they're the running late at the registry office? Yeah, no, they won't be. Uh, I've checked. 
They'll see you married at 2.30. That is if we're there by 2.30. I'd have been ready ages ago if I hadn't had to iron his shirt. There was nothing wrong with Looked my shirt. Because if he slept in it. I only bought it this it morning. terribly creased. You're, uh, you're looking very lovely, if I may say so, Miss Peterson. How sweet of you, Bill, thank Except you. Except I thought we were going to a wedding, not a funeral. I have to wear this. Will you be wearing your wig as well? I haven't time to go to the robing room, have I? I'll have to get ready in the taxi. Couldn't you have hidden that very expensive wedding outfit underneath your gown? Only a man could make such an idiotic suggestion. That's 150 quid down the drain, you know. Oh. Have I remembered my bands? Uh, Have I put in uh, that? You're well, Miss Peters. Am I? Yes. Oh, yes, so I am. Ian, what are you doing? Pouring myself a drink. Does a drink get rid of irritability, then? It helps. In that case, I'll have one. Bill? Uh, no, thanks. Uh, I'm not feeling irritable. You would be if you'd had a brand new shirt ripped off your back. I swear all she did was ironing fresh creases. Have you got the flight tickets? Of course I've got the flight tickets. Don't forget the front door key. Now, why should I forget the front door key? Here, hurry up and drink this or we shall be late. No, we shan't. Yes, we shall. It's 5-2 already. I make it 10-2. You're slow. You're fast. No, I'm not. What, what do, you do you make, make the time, time Bill? Well, if you don't mind, I'll just keep quiet. Yes, that's what I should have done. Here, here. Now, don't start. Who's starting? You are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Oh, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. I call upon these persons here present to witness that I, Ian Donald, do take thee, Harriet Joan, that I, Ian Donald, do take thee, Harriet Joan, to be my lawful wedded wife. To be my lawful wedded wife. I call upon these persons here present to witness. I call upon these persons here present to witness. That I, Harriet Joan, do take thee, Ian Donald. That I, Harriet Joan, do take thee, Ian Donald. To be my lawful wedded husband. To be my lawful wedded husband. Do you hand the ring to the groom? Thank you. Is that all? Yes. You may kiss each other if you so wish. Uh, it's uh, nearly a quarter to, Miss Pettis. This is Moody. It's still nearly a quarter to. Got. Well, you'll make it all right. Got what a way to start a honeymoon. It's not my four seat and reserve judgment. No. What do you mean, no? You've got six minutes. Perhaps your arguments weren't persuasive enough. Quite a smooth ceremony, I thought. Usually, you don't know what you're talking about. What, me? No, him. Oh, yes, I do. No, you don't. Yes, I do. Yes, well, I hope you'll both be very happy. The two questions to be answered are. Who was in control of the black gold on the day she was involved in a collision with the Prince Charming? The ship owner or the charterer? And who aboard the black gold of anyone was the negligent party? The captain, Captain McGregor, was without doubt under the orders of the charterer. That made him a servant of the charterer. It therefore follows that the pilot, Mr. Turnton, was also a servant of the charterer. However, the ship owner insisted on retaining the services of the chief engineer, Mr. Lawrence, and furthermore, paid his wages. By so doing, did the ship owner retain control over the hull and machinery? It was argued, and argued most eloquently, that the ship's steering mechanism caused the black gold to collide with the Prince John. That if the said mechanism was faulty, the ship owner and not the charterer would be liable. Let us examine the facts. About one year before the collision, Mr. Lawrence said he noticed a change in the turning capability of the black gold. He stripped her down, had correspondence with the shipbuilders, had other engineers look her over. He also sent a written report to the ship owner. Everyone agreed there was nothing wrong with that. Furthermore, the defendant was not able to prove that during that year a single accident occurred, a single problem arose, a single complaint was filed with regard to the turning capability of the black gold. It is my belief that her turning capability did not constitute a fault and that the chief engineer was not negligent. I also believe the ship owner, Mr. Papalonius, rightly and properly insisted on appointing the chief engineer as much in the interests of the charterer as in his own. 
the rights he retained can be compared to those exercised by owners of leased property. It is my considered judgment that the Charter Party was a charter by demise and that there was negligence on the part of both the pilot and the captain. The pilot for not obeying the collision regulations and the captain for not countermanding the pilot's order to alter course. The charterer, as temporary owner of the black gold, must be held responsible for their negligence. I therefore give judgment for the plaintiff, Mr. Papaloni. Costs, my lord. Costs for the plaintiff. I must say I'm looking forward to taking on the others now. We are not accepting liability. What, with the Prince Charming behaving like a sleepwalker? It's my turn to congratulate you. You see, you specialise. Don't be fobbed off. Someone's trying to attract your attention. Yeah. My husband. Has he been to a wedding? His own. Well, Copenhagen, here we come. Ah, uh, no, we're not going to Copenhagen. We're not? No. Where are we going then? Bogner Regis? No. Rome. Rome? <laughs> 